Hello there, and welcome back to this Damnful Idealistic Crusade. I am the motion picture analyst, and this will be the next in my series of James Bond audio commentaries on the uh, original official Eon-produced films. This, of course, being on the fifth film in the series, 1967's You Only Live Twice, which in a lot of ways marks the end of an era along with the end of the original run of films starring Sean Connery. And I hope to go into some of the film's production history, my own feelings on the film, uh, some general feelings uh, reflected throughout the Bond fan community, and uh, various bits of character and scene introspection, uh, along with whatever else pops up in, uh, in my head at any given moment. So uh, in the tradition of my previous four commentaries, this is a very loose, very informal, uh, rough chat, if you will. I do these tracks live, and uh, I, I try to keep them flowing, but it will also involve whatever is uh, going on in my head at the moment. And when I watch the Bond films, I have about 10,000 thoughts go through my head at any given moment. Uh, various reflections, things I notice for the first time, maybe. Uh, just like any film you've seen for you know, you know more than a hundred times, or a film that's uh, become a part of your life, uh, it, it, that uh, it's, it's very difficult to have a, a singular thought, especially when, when uh, the film is actually in motion. So uh, again, this is not a professionally recording commentary, nor uh, as the official commentary say, nor is it meant to be a definitive history of the film. But I hope I can relate uh, some new thoughts and some of my own reflections, and hopefully it is a uh, nice listen for those who care to listen to me babble about You Only Live Twice. So with that being said, uh, go ahead and get a copy of the film, whichever you prefer, and we will do a rough sync. Again, uh, this will be a rough sync, so it won't be exactly perfect, but uh, we should be able to get within the general ballpark about each scene that comes up. And, of course, I always try to wait a few seconds because uh, every version will have different opening logos, which changes the timing around a little bit. Uh, as I've done on the previous commentaries, if you're looking at a more modern version of the film, please go ahead and go to the options and be sure to select the original mono audio track. Uh, the 5.1 remixes on the Bond films are really not good, and particularly on the mono films, uh, they can be very destructive to the original sound design. There's a lot of new sound effects added, and a lot of the uh, equalization and sound placements are really affected. Uh, so you really want to respect the original sound design of these films, which are really vastly underrated for their amazing single channel mixes. Uh, so be sure if you're looking at any of the later DVDs or the Blu-ray version, uh, be sure to select the original mono track and uh, don't go with the uh, 5.1 remix. So with that being said, let's go ahead and try and get ourselves queued up here. Be sure and be on the zero minute, zero second mark and I'll just do a basic count in. So in five, four, Three, two, one, press play now. So here we are with the opening gun barrel, once again with Sean Connery actually in the barrel this time. This is pretty much reusing the one shot for Thunderball, as he still has the trademark fedora. And uh, interestingly, you can tell this is a slightly different feeling film, right with uh, John Barry's opening cue, which is a, actually a bit less bombastic than all the previous gun barrels, and perfectly goes into the pre-title sequence, which will be the hijacking of the U.S. space capsule, and of course setting up the plot of the film. Uh, I always think it's interesting to look at the actual gun barrel cues of each individual film because it really does, uh, when it does its job right, and almost all of them do, it sets up the tone for the film to follow, even though it's a very short, tiny piece. And of course, John Barry's cue for uh, the, the opening pre title sequence is completely ominous beyond belief, which is perfectly fitting. Now, of course, You Only Live Twice, coming in the wake of Thunderball, uh, being the biggest film of the Bond series and at the height of the spy craze and Bond mania of the 1960s, uh, had a lot to live up to, and rumors are already floating around, and Connery confirmed this would be his last uh, turn as James Bond in the official film. So there, there was a lot riding on this. There was a lot of built-in uh, public expectation, but it also uh, wound up being released really after the peak of the spy craze and uh, when people were just tired of all of the uh, Bond competitors that were practically everywhere, and so there's a bit of fatigue 
And of course, that led to eventually the film having a lower box office taking than Thunderball and being slightly disappointing to, I know, the producers and United Artists and everybody else. Uh, so it's always important to understand the context of when these films were released. But, uh, you know, that definitely explains a lot why You Only Live Twice is once again, like Thunderball, going for great spectacle and going for great scope. Now, again, to mention this pre-title sequence, it is setting up stories to follow. James Bond does not feature in the pre-titles, so this is once again going back to the uh, sort of the establishing style of the From Russia With Love pre-titles. And if you look at the effects here, I mean, they can seem hokey now, but for the time period, these are you know, exceptionally well done for uh, what most feature films were doing because most were not very special effects laden. Uh, ironically, you know, these were really great for the time. You look at... Uh, a rival film like Ice Station Zebra and the effects uh, done around the same time are quite laughable today in comparison to these. But then, you know, shortly after You Only Live Twice, we get 2001 A Space Odyssey, where <laughs> the effects are, are far beyond what are achieved here. So um, I always like to point out, you know, for the time period, uh, these are very well done. And mentioning 2001, seeing the terrifying death of the uh, American astronaut here when his lifeline is cut. It is very reminiscent of the terrifying death of Frank Poole in 2001. Of course, different, but similar in ways. So I always always think that's interesting, uh, you know, noting that uh, at this point in 1967, this was probably the best uh, special effects we had seen for um, for outer space outside of the best of the 50s science fiction films, which of course were also very limited in what they could do special effects wise. And here we see everybody's favorite uh, <laughs> control operator in so many British films, the incomparable Shane Rimmer and the first of three Bond films he appears in. And so now we see into this really interesting place to have a meeting of UN officials to discuss the hijacking, hijacking of the US space capsule. And uh, here you can already tell, again, this film is going for spectacle. This is a film where Ken Adam and his production design are going for broke, which of course is fully represented by the life-changing, amazing volcano set, which is one of the astonishing great sets of, of cinema that uh, is, is unquestionably one of the most astounding things you'll ever see in a film. But also, it automatically shows up the difference in the look and feel of the film. Uh, I should also mention that the actor playing the uh, U.S. ambassador is played by David Bauer, who turns up again in Diamonds Are Forever as the <laughs> wonderfully slimy uh, Morton Slumber at the uh, Slumber Mortuary. But anyway, if you look at the, the look of the film, you automatically note, yes, we're still in scope, but the composition, the color, everything is different. And that is, of course, because this is the first film that was not shot by uh, cinematographer Ted Moore, who was off doing other films like uh, Man for All Seasons, which is what he won his Oscar for. This film was shot by the legendary cameraman Freddie Young, who, of course, had come off of doing the uh, astonishing, again, cinema-defining uh, David Lean epics. And here we are introduced to Bond in a wonderful, wonderful line, and of course in a very sort of knowing at the audience moment where he's in a tryst with a girl. But of course this is a setup for yet another killing Bond off in the very beginning of the film, which again was a uh, Harry Saltzman idea that Harry loved to do, which is why it turned up in For Russia With Love. But um, this was apparently part of the original script that was commissioned and written by Harold Jack Bloom, which had a number of the wacky, uh, um, you know, out of this world ideas that wind up in the, the eventual film, which is why he gets a story credit. Um, but this, this whole opening sequence on the burial at sea is, is one, apparently one of the few things that does survive along with some of the uh, ninja material. But then the rest of the film was uh, written by Roald Dahl, who was not aware that there had been an original script uh, commissioned. It'd be really amazing to be able to read the original um, uh, Bloom script someday. But again, this is very much in, in line with uh, seeing Bond killed at the beginning of For Much With Love. And of course, in Thunderball, when the first thing we see is the coffin with the JB initials. Uh, now we're into the Morris Bender design, design title sequence, which is really striking it fits of course the poetic nature of the song and score for the film and does have some of the uh the silhouette usage which he really started using on thunderball uh in the iconic style of course 
there's some of that in the Dr. No titles, particularly with the dancing figures and then the three blind mice. But this one is an interesting title because we're seeing actual faces of all of these uh, Japanese women, and we're seeing all of this iconography over the, uh, the lava rivers and volcanoes. But then we get the nude silhouettes interposed with the uh, projection and the sort of uh, twirling uh, twirling shapes and things it, it really gives uh, the whole title sequence has a different feel to it again there's this poetic sense that again perfectly enmeshes with what is I think unquestionably the most poetic of all of the title songs which is here performed by Nancy Sinatra uh, it's very interesting to look at the production history of the song uh, because, of course, they originally went to Frank Sinatra, who was also uh, going to do Moonraker later on, but it just didn't work out. Uh, Sinatra suggested his daughter do it, who was uh, incredibly nervous doing the, uh, doing the recording, so the vocal is comprised of many, many, many different takes stitched together. But there's this intimacy to it that uh, really... It just makes it stand on its own. Uh, it is a one-of-a-kind song. It's not just one of the great Bond songs. It's one of the great songs, period, I think. And it establishes John Barry's main melodies for his score, which uh, just when you think he can't go any further than what he did on his epic rendering of Thunderball for the Thunderball score, here he goes uh, and for a string section that almost sounds heavenly. I think some of the melodies in You Only Live Twice are some of the most beautiful in any film score, period. Uh, here we see the screen credits. You get the credit for Harold Jack Bloom and the credit for Roald Dahl. You do have most of the key production team returning, but the two, the I should say the three primary differences being uh, now we're with Freddie Young uh, and on cinematography. Uh, the screenwriters have changed around, so this is the first film not written by, uh, in some fashion by Richard Maybaum which I think is the key difference. And then uh, Lewis Gilbert comes on for the uh, first of his three Bond films, which all ironically deal with uh, being large spectacles. And uh, similarly, if you look at their core structures, uh, there is a similarity uh, to You Only Live Twice and The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker as well, leading some to almost label the later two films as so, uh, semi-remakes of the You Only Live Twice story. Um, that was not exactly intended, but that's just a fun thing to note. So this is the burial at sea of Bond, and I guess we should go ahead and get it out in the open here. You Only Live Twice is obviously the point at which the film series completely deviates from Ian Fleming's uh, original uh, source novels. Uh, all You Only Live Twice, the film, really has to do with uh, the source novel is the title. It takes place in Japan. It has Blofeld, and uh, Bond is presumed dead at one point. Um, you could make a few other arguments, but those, those are the key elements. Um, and also Bond being disguised as uh, uh, poor Japanese uh, for uh, infiltration purposes. Um, that's, that's really about it. Uh, you do have some of the characters like uh, Dicko Henderson and Tiger Tanaka and Kasi Suzuki, but uh, they are uh, different in a number of ways. And uh, you know, outside of those sort of elements, the film goes completely in a different direction. And uh, this underwater scene was shot in the Bahamas with the same underwater team who did all of the sequences for Thunderball. It's interesting to mention Thunderball here because uh, Roald Dahl, when he wrote the screenplay, was basically uh, unaware of, of Bond and Bond structure. He had seen Goldfinger, and that was about it. So the producers basically told him about the formula. You had to do this, this, this. And in a lot of ways, he was basically given Thunderball as the sort of template, uh, right down to having the, um, the sort of three Bond girl structure of having the uh, opening act Bond girl who becomes the sacrificial lamb, the uh, baddie evil one, and uh, being the second who has to get it at some point and then the third being the one who remains you know, relatively chaste until uh, having the final fade out clinch with Bond as it were so when you when you look at it that way it starts to make sense why uh, in a lot of ways you know twice feels sort of familiar uh, I think it does have a lot of the same issues that Thunderball does but it, it plays differently and it feels different uh, what it does do differently from Thunderball is uh, it's not as languid, and of course the runtime is a lot shorter because You Only Live Twice is the last film in the series to clock at under a two-hour runtime, uh, really until uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, which has almost the exact same runtime, ironically. Um, I think that is uh, due to not having such a, an extreme rushed uh, post-production schedule uh, where Peter Hunt was having to edit Thunderball like mad. 
but also uh, trying to avoid some of the pitfalls of the the sort of uh, draggy feeling a lot of people felt about Thunderball, uh, which really have to do more with its middle act and not so much the underwater sequences. Now, this is a reinvention of the Bond Money Penny M office scene now aboard a submarine. You can see every, every writer and everyone was always convinced they had to come up with ways to spice this up to keep it from being the same, but still being the same at the same time, if, if that makes sense. And everybody has a little bit of fun with this, and we see this really amazing set design that's supposed to be on a submarine. And, and it, it works beautifully in recreating the M office, but, you know, well underwater. And we see M in his naval uniform for the first time. Now here, again, you can see the total difference, I think, in the uh, visual composition style, everything. Here, the, the close-ups, I think, you know, Little Twice are really stunning. And um, apparently, Lewis Gilbert and Freddie Young did ask to uh, shoot the film in large format, uh, uh, especially uh, in particular Super Panavision 70, which was the format that uh, Freddie Young used to uh, shoot uh, Lawrence of Arabia, for example. Uh, there have been some rumors that maybe there's some tests done, uh, particularly trying to shoot the uh, massive Canadam Volcano Base set, uh, but the film was shot in standard 35 millimeter Panavision, just like Thunderball. But uh, like Ted Moore did, Freddie Young gives it such a high gloss and expansive feel that uh, it feels larger than life while still maintaining the, the core elements visually that Ted Moore had put there. So I think Freddie Young does such an amazing job at uh, making the film look so amazing that uh, you know I don't think it's, it's much of an argument. You Only Live Twice is frequently cited as one of the best looking, if not the best shot of the series. And I think it is a strong contender, but uh, you know, it's... It's definitely, uh, you, you know, helpful when you have two of the greatest cinematographers who ever lived shoot the first five Bond films in a row. So every, everyone who comes afterwards has a lot to live up to. Again, you can see a lot of what's going to come up in uh, the rest of the film's uh, set design here in the submarine already. A lot of steel usage, a lot of chrome that we'll see turn up in the volcano base. And here we have the establishment of the... Um, of the uh, code recognition phrase, which gives Bond and Money Penny a nice, uh, cute repartee back and forth. But I've always loved the moment when Sean uh, gets, when Money Penny asks which girl, and then Sean turns the light up, uh, you know, as if interrogating Money Penny, which girl. Now Sean plays this with a little bit of humor, which is necessary to to sell the "I love you" joke. And all Bond fans still want a copy of Instant Japanese. And we say we, we took a first in Oriental languages at Cambridge, but of course we're all hopeless. So at least we're moving at a good clip already. Um, I also want to mention, it's, it's frequently cited that because this was Sean's last film uh, originally, of course he leaves the series at this point and was dis disenchanted with the series and the producers and the typecasting and just the uh, severe um, media focus and scrutiny he was under. Um, he is still fully engaged here, and the film has great epic moments like this where Bond is shot out of a torpedo tube, which is really enhanced by the John Barry cue, I think. And it was uh, this cue was used in the trailer to great effect. Um, but it's going to be something I'm going to come back to a lot. Uh, I think Sean gives a great performance here. I don't think the issue is that he's as much disinterested because he was always a consummate professional, but I think the issue is that because the film is a spectacle, the focus is not on Bond himself. It's on the story, so the focus has changed. Now, this is the wonderful introduction to Tokyo with the flashing neon signs, and we have to keep in mind the travelogue aspect of Bond because at this point in 1967, most audiences, particularly U.S. and U.K. audiences, were not going to get to go to Japan very often, if ever. This was still a, a far-off place for most people and very exotic. And in a lot of ways, I think You Only Live Twice is perhaps the greatest single travelogue for uh, visiting Japan because you see this film and you you just you want to go there so badly. Um, which is also in Fleming's novel. So we do sort of get the Bond immersed into Japan, Jap Japanese culture a little bit, not quite as much as the novel per se, but we get enough of it in the film that it's respectful, uh, you know, because there is always a, a, um, a sort of culture clash of sorts, which is discussed in, to a much greater extent in Fleming's novel and, and in other films and stories since this point of the sort of... Um, 
the the white man or gaijin in uh, Japanese culture being an outsider. But you can kind of see that here a little bit when Bond walks in to the uh, um, the room full of sumo wrestlers and he's the only one dressed in a suit. There's a lot of little things like that that I find really interesting. And, uh, you know, the, the more you read into uh, Japanese culture, the more you understand, uh, and the more you read Fleming's novel, you can read things into the film that... Uh, uh, may have not been intended, but they're definitely there, and it, it helps give a greater sense of realism and uh, to the proceedings especially. Here we see an actual uh, uh, sumo wrestling match, and uh, this is at an actual location. They, they, uh, the production sort of set up this, this fight here, and uh, again, the whole notion of this being, you know, the great Japanese travelogue film, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. You have that sort of you-are-there feeling. Again, the close-ups are amazing, and again, it's very interesting to see how the edges of the scope frame are used. So we see Aki come in for the first time from the edge of the frame and sort of stop there, and she is this sort of striking angelic figure. We get a little bit of spycraft throughout this sequence and the immediate uh, sequence after where uh, we have the swapping of the recognition code and things like that. So it's a little hearkening back to From Rush With Love. There's a, there is some spycraft, you know, Live Twice, uh, even though it's frequently uh, accused of being, you know, just a big spectacle film and there's a volcano rocket base and it's been, you know, almost made into a cliche of sorts. The big Bond films like, you know, Live Twice being uh, mocked and made fun of by Austin Powers and other things. But it is still serious. It does have some grounding. But again, I think it does have some of the same inherent slower rhythms of Thunderball, in addition to obviously having its entire script being based around the sort of structure and formula of Thunderball. And of course, it was following in the wake of that film, which became uh, not only the most successful film in the series to that point, but is still uh, arguably the most successful film inflation adjusted in the series history. And of course, was at the height of the spy craze that was really spawned by Bond and the first three films. And again, there's this sort of back and forth where we don't know exactly who Aki is, they do the recognition code, but Bond is still having to probe, and he's still having to, you know, figure out exactly what her allegiances are, where they're going, and, you know, he knows that something's strange because Henderson didn't come himself. There's a lot of beautiful transitions in this film, but this may be my exact favorite. The way that Bond gets up, and this particular John Barry Q is one that gets stuck in my head frequently, almost on a daily basis most times. Um, it's just mo little moments like this throughout the film that add that sort of slice of life flavor. And of course, all the shots of Bond and Aki in the beautiful Toyota 2000 GT uh, are mostly process shots done on the stage, which is, you know, rather obvious on most video transfers. Of course, the film was a hard top when it had to be converted into a convertible because um, it was the roof was too low for Sean to fit in it, which is one of the great uh, production anecdotes of the film. An interesting note, you have to pay attention here, but of course Bond takes off his shoes before entering a, a, a Japanese house, which comes into play later because, of course, Bond will have to steal the shoes of Henderson's killer, which is why uh, in the fight sequence to come, he's a little uh, off his game because he's clonking around in giant shoes, which are uh, very uh, clashing because, of course, they're black and white. <laughs> Now here is Charles Gray as uh, Dicko Henderson, uh, the great character from Fleming's novel, who unfortunately meets a very early end uh, and doesn't uh, have all the great, amazing, larger-than-life uh, scenes that uh, he has in Fleming's novel. Of course, Gray would come back and play Blofeld for the uh, third Blofeld appearance, uh, in person, I should say, in Diamonds Are Forever, with a completely different tack, but... Uh, it's it's wonderful when actors would come back. Uh, it was not meant to break continuity, uh, but of course uh, this was long before the video era, so people would not get to see the films repeatedly over and over back to back. I love the whole introduction here and Bond test for the uh, for the gammy leg, as it were, to uh, establish Henderson's identity. So again, the the I like when the spycraft is actually here in the films and Bond is having to proceed cautiously because there is danger about. Earlier we see that he burns the, the note with Henderson's address in M's office. 
Now the line there about uh, you've never been to Japan, been to Japan before, Mr. Bond. No, never. And of course, in From Russia with Love, there's the mention of uh, once when I was with him in Tokyo. We had a rather interesting experience. So either uh, Bond is lying because that was top secret, or he just doesn't want to go into it. The actual mistake in this scene is when Henderson says, uh, stirred, not shaken, as the proper martini order, and Bond just says, correct. So that's been debated. It's probably just a mistake, but I like to think that Bond just says, uh, perfect to be polite, because he kind of looks at Henderson a little bit. That may be just me reading into this scene a little bit. But uh, we get the little bit here about the the Russian vodka and, uh, you know, among certain other things, perhaps information or other things he gets from the embassy. Now, this is a wonderful little scene. It advances the plot a little bit. Again, beautiful, beautiful closer shots, beautiful composition. I think, again, the, the close shots stand out most. And we get this beautiful uh, clash of styles, as Henderson points out, in uh, Ken Adams' set. Uh, you know, we have the four-poster bed there, but with all of the Japanese stylings around it. Now, this is one of the most iconic deaths in film history. I don't care what you think, but the cutting off of Henderson's dialogue, the way that Charles Gray freezes, and then, of course, Bond goes over and pulls the body out. And we have the knife sticking through, which, of course, would only be possible in a Japanese house, being able to go through the, uh, through the wall there. Uh, just one of the most iconic deaths in any film. And here, of course... Bond will take down the guy who, for some reason, is wearing a, a, a face mask. I've never understood exactly why he is. But, of course, he will have to uh, take his shoes there. Now, John Barry's Q here is one of my absolute favorites. The way that he obviously brings in the James Bond theme, which is, of course, the, the core musical identity for any Bond film, but the way he makes it sly and slinky with little tiny accents to sort of suggest the Japanese flavor, it, it is one of the most perfect renderings of Bond in any film, in any moment in any film in the series. As Bond is stealing the clothes and then assuming the posture to then uh, take the place of the would be assassin. And of course, you know, you have to wonder, okay, well, what is the guy, <laughs> what is the guy thinking as he drives off? Oh, did, I guess he got shot or something. Ah, just go, sit down in the back. In some versions of the film, uh, certain video versions, some of the incidental Japanese dialogue is subtitled. I don't know if that was on original prints. I don't think it was. Um, it's just incidental things, uh, but that is in certain versions of the film. So here we have the first appearance of the Osado building, which is still in existence in Tokyo today. Uh, this was the, um, I believe it was the Hilton Hotel. Um, not sure, I guess it's still a hotel now, I'm not for sure, but the building is still there. Love to go there someday. But of course, this is all Ken Adam. Um, again, you notice all the usage of wood, uh, of slanting roof lines, and all the steel and chrome accents, plus all of the black leather uh, sofas and chairs and things. Bond trying to get the jump on him there. Um, it's a beautiful moment, but, uh, you know, it, it's it's a little like um, Bond's having to think on his feet, which is something that's, I, I think, always uh, appreciated because it shows Bond's intelligence. Now, this is a great fight here where practically every element of the room is getting used, and this great moment with the sofa here. Uh, again, you have really great uh, sound design and usage of sound effects, uh, much in the same way as the previous four films. This was the fifth and final film that was, uh, the sound was done by Norman Wanstall, the sound effects and things, and uh, his contributions are really incredible for the first five films. And Bond looks like he's really had it here. And again, we, we get this wonderful down and dirty grittiness, but practically every aspect of the room is getting used. And then later on in the great scene uh, where Bond is waiting for Asado, Bond practically looks around the room where everything has been you know, repaired, uh, much to his, per, uh, uh, you know, he's totally perplexed. And of course, you know, obviously they just shot that scene first and then shot this one where they tore up the office. Now Bond dumps the body in the <laughs> the drink cabinet, which is a, a funny touch. But this is my favorite joke in the film. Bond pours himself a drink after a, a raucous fight, and he's you know he toasts the dead body. But the best joke in the film is, of course, Siamese vodka, and Bond is totally disgusted. <laughs> so, 
it's it's little flourishes like that and then of course the mirror reflects the safe which was exposed during the fight which is another really great uh, moment of uh, using the set and um, using the geography without having to have a scene of Bond hunting around and everything. Now, this is one of the most useful Q gadgets Bond has ever used, and unfortunately, it uh, does not make a return appearance. This is the mini safe cracker. And uh, talking about the look of this film, the cinematography, and the close-ups, this close-up of Bond here and this lovely uh, suspenseful sequence is built up when the guards start to walk in. The close-ups of Sean's face here I think are perhaps the the most impactful close-up in the entire series. I mean, the composition, the the sharpness, the detail on Sean's face when his eyes flick up. You can see the the slight beats of sweat on his forehead after that that fight and everything, and that that tension, that nervous tension is there. And then you hear the sound effects of the guard's footsteps stop at the door there. So this is a wonderful moment. Uh, beautifully edited and put together and directed and composed visually. So that's just a moment that always sticks out to me. And I've always loved to hear the sound effect immediately starts of the alarm as soon as Bond pulls the, <laughs> pulls the safe open. So it's like, you know, you, you can't win for trying. And then another wonderful gag here. Uh, he waits for the guards to, to come in the door because, of course, he can't get out. And he ducks behind the filing cabinet. So there's, there's always those, those nice flourishes of, of humor. It's not as apparent and uh, as they were, say, before, when things were a lot fresher and, uh, you know, they would always cook things up on set, obviously, particularly uh, Connery and Terrence Young in the three Terrence Young films. Again, you see Bond here is running a little awkwardly because he's clunking around in these, these big black and white shoes. Uh, I'll admit, it took me forever to notice that. And then suddenly I'm like, why is Bond in these weird shoes? Oh, he stole them from the assassin before. Of course, Aki pulls up in the nick of time, and uh, this will be the first of several times that this happens. So uh, you have to wonder how they get away with having uh, gunmen outside the Osado building all the time, just shooting at people who walk out. Again, this is a process shot. Uh, all of the scenes in the car pretty much are. And again, Bond is playing this very, uh, very straight and direct because Henderson's been killed. Bond just had to uh, kill a man, and something is definitely up, so he's trying to get something out of Aki, and she just runs off. This is a wonderful little uh, transitional scene, actually. It serves great transitional purpose because, of course, uh, this is going to introduce us to Taiko Tanaka and uh, introduce us to his secret method of getting around Tokyo undetected. But there's a, there's a wonderful sort of otherworldly effect here because it's a normal location but all we hear are the echoing footsteps as they run down the corridor and then this is the famous shot of the tilting floor into the slide of course Bond should probably know something is up when Aki just stands there and stares uh, this of course is probably the inspiration for the si similar sequence in Moonraker that turns up with the tilting rock into the pool of course, the, uh, there was a process shot of Connery there for extra emphasis, and that the first shot of him hitting the slide is uh, repeated. Uh, it was, uh, you know, of course, a Peter Hunt technique when he didn't have enough footage or to make it play. Um, he was introduced to Tiger Tanaka, played by the wonderful Tetsuro Tamba. Uh, he is dubbed as our uh, a number of the actors and actresses in the early Bonds. He's dubbed by uh, Robert Rietti, who dubbed uh, Largo as well and Thunderball. And it's really interesting to see how much of a different characterization we get uh, in contrast to Largo's voice. Um, I can't picture either Tamba or uh, Adolfo Celli in these films without uh, the dubbing. Um, but uh, if you look at the trailer, you can catch a glimpse of the on-set audio with Tamba's actual voice. Because his English was actually quite good at this point, and he did help uh, serve as interpreter uh, between the English crew and a number of the uh, Japanese crew and uh, Japanese performers, for example. Again, beautiful composition here in this two shot, and we get the, the reprise of the I love you line, which causes a nice bit of, of humor that's underplayed beautifully. I love you. Glad we got that out of the way. So again, uh, we've moved quite quickly. The film unfolds at a very quick pace. Again, Peter Hunt being, uh, you know, behind the moviola, as it were, always means that scenes are going to go very quickly. The plot's going to move on at a good clip because in a Bond film, you need that because the last thing you need is time to start questioning all of the impracticalities of the plot and things like that. But also it helps you from uh, realizing that uh, as a film, the story is, is, is much slower. The pacing is slower. 
and uh, you know we're, we're we're at this point we're starting to leave the practical world as it were. Everything is larger than life. Love the moment there. If you look closely in the elevator. Sean has to duck down because obviously it's designed for uh, people, uh, Japanese people who are of a shorter stature than, you know, a tall Scotsman. And he ducks down going in the train there. It's a little, some little touches like that. You'll, you'll see him do that a number of times in the film. Uh, it's one of those sort of blink it and you miss things. Um, here we get the mention of, of Saki, uh, uh, 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit like this ish showing that Bond does have an understanding and appreciation of Japanese culture being a civilized man of the world. Again, going back to the travelogue aspect, which is really important and something I feel has definitely gotten lost in the uh, modern films in particular, because, of course, uh, global travel is much more uh, affordable, much more open to people and a lot less exotic. So it's very hard to make things as exotic. Um, but still, I think it is possible, and it is an element that is sorely lacking in the modern films. So this is examining the micro dot that was found on the photograph that Bond took from Osato's safe, and you have to wonder, uh, Bond must have been extremely lucky to grab the one uh, plot device out of the safe when there were all those papers there. You see, he just grabs random things out of the safe, and you know, good thing it was a, a clue to Spectre. Um, this, of course, sets up the uh, Ningpo and the Kobe Dock sequence later. Again, going back to the notion of, of this being Connery's last film, uh, for, for the time at least, uh, his dissatisfaction with the series, uh, most people also don't realize the amount of scrutiny he was under was unprecedented. And when the production went to Japan, uh, they experienced the intensive Japanese fan culture, which uh, really was not quite documented at, this, at the time. And uh, the amount of scrutiny that Connery was under just imploded and uh, only hastened his intense desire to leave. But it had already been building over time, and he was very dissatisfied with uh, his production deal and how he's being treated by the producers in particular. Um, so there was a lot of frustrations. Uh, Terrence Young experienced a lot of that himself, which was partially why he didn't direct Goldfinger and then didn't return after Thunderball. But again, I do think you have the uh, the problem of having to deal with the success and having to top yourself. Of course, talking about competition, uh, the uh, spoof film Casino Royale, produced by Charles K. Feldman, had been released several months before You Only Live Twice in 1967. And Cubby Broccoli in particular always felt that that did hurt the film's uh, uh, box office uh, eventually. Um, and all the advertisements heavily promoted, you know, Sean Connery throughout the trailers and posters and things, you know, that this was the real Bond, not to get fooled by the rival film. And, of course, Casino Royale had a budget that spiraled out of control and wound up costing, uh, you know, even more than You Only Live Twice did in its production budget. Um, but, you know, it's it's obvious that did, you know, probably impact the uh, box office of You Only Live Twice some and the overall um, reception. But I think more important was it was really after the peak of the spy craze. And like with any sort of... Um, in, in any sort of craze that happens, eventually people get tired and worn out when they're overwhelmed by it. Uh, it happens naturally. So You Only Live Twice was still ridiculously successful. It made about uh, $111 million in its original release worldwide, whereas Thunderball made about, I believe it was $141 million. And these were all before inflation, because inflation adjusted, they're you know even far more successful than that. Um, and of course, it was still more successful than the first three films, box office wise, but it was still a noticeable drop off after the, uh, you know, earth shattering heights of Thunderball. So um, it's, it's, you have to come at, come at the film with all this stuff in mind. And I do think it does the film a disservice to always say, oh, well, Sean looks tired and Sean looks bored and things. You know, I'm, I'm sure there were thoughts like that going through his mind because he definitely expressed them and uh, definitely still had issues with the producers after this point. But he still was always the consummate professional and everyone, uh, you know, talking about the on-set experience, uh, you know, related the same. Again, I think the feel of the film is totally different and that, of course, you know, we do have a different director and Louis Gilbert, who was an interesting choice for, for Yield of Twice because... At this point, he was becoming much more well-known for, for dramas. Before this, uh, he had had just a, uh, a really great hit with the film Alfie, which was the film that really 
um, really broke Michael Caine as a great star, although he had done Zulu and uh, the masterpiece The Ipcrest File, which was also produced by Harry Saltzman. I think uh, You Only Live Twice has a different feel. I think it is more leisurely, and I think you can feel some of that as well in Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, and I do think there is a slight unity between the three Lewis Gilbert films that is indicative of uh, being from the same director. So uh, people don't talk about the Bond directors very much, but they are crucial to understanding the films just as much as understanding the, uh, the time in which they were produced and understanding the series history and what each film was attempting to do, what its aim was. Uh, each film does have a different aim, and that is also critical to understand. Uh, at this point, you know, Bond was a global phenomenon still, and, you know, Thunderball was one, along with Goldfinger, they were two of the biggest films in history. So, you only live twice, you know, the sky was the limit. So, uh, for example, when they were, came up with the idea for the volcano base for uh, being Spectre's hideout, uh, you know, Ken Adam was trying to figure out how would they build it, and Cubby Brock, they asked him, well, how much do you think it would cost to build? Ken Adam said, uh, I have no idea, and Cubby Brock, they said, uh, how about a million dollars? And they literally agreed there. And, you know, building one set for about a million dollars, you know, that was the entire budget of Dr. No. So already we were at that that scale of, oh, you want to build the biggest set in the world for a million dollars? Yeah, sure, go ahead. You know, it's like there was nowhere to go but up. This is that wonderful little quiet moment where Bond is examining the office. And uh, I love the bit where he looks directly at the surveillance camera, which, uh, again, the very commonplace now, but it was it was quite a novel thing for 1967. And uh, sort of inference of the, uh, the usage of technology throughout uh, Japan, which is sort of intrinsically linked with Japanese culture in most people's minds today. Um, but it was already already something that people thought of in the 1960s. So you see a lot of little things like that, of course, having a helipad right outside the office, things like that. Uh, it's not just an office. It's got all this stuff and, you know, a helipad right outside. Of course, uh, Osado is played by uh, Teru Shimada, who uh, was in a lot of great uh, Hollywood films, uh, particularly always, uh, I'm always reminded of the film he did with Bogart, Tokyo Joe, uh, where he played uh, the compatriot of Bogart in that film. And of course, uh, here we have the wonderful Helga Brandt, played by Karen Dorr. Uh, and here you get the inference of this film is based off of Thunderball, because in almost every single way, right down to her red hair, Helga Brandt is basically a Fiona Volpe clone, uh, right right down to the, the structure of her character and the placement in the second act. That shot there, uh, showing the ceiling off beautifully, you get that sort of slanted line feel, which is so intricately linked in the, the workings of Ken Adam. And here is the wonderful gag and gadget that, uh, here we have an Osada safe, the X-ray machine, showing the Walther PPK, giving Bond away, of course, as an agent, showing that the villain is not taken in by this whole charade. But we get this whole wonderful, humorous back-and-forth banter with this this cover that obviously is not sticking very well. It's also interesting to hear Bond talk about, you know, monosodium glutamate. And uh, we get the cigarette smoke, and Osado directly references it. So, they, you know, the, the humor is is here, and it's interesting to see how well Roald Dahl picked up on it, not being accustomed to the Bond style in his writing. and uh, it, But it doesn't always have that same sparkle of the earlier films, and I think also that part of that has to do with the fact this is the fifth go-around. You know, by this point, Connery was so well established in the role, you can see him, you know, relaxed a bit, but... I think why most people feel that Connery isn't engaged, he he doesn't have that same, you know, attack, that same energy that he has in the earlier films. Um, I don't think he ever quite had the same uh, rapport with the other directors that he had with Terrence Young, that same deep thing. And I think that was also because they did the first film together and they sort of built a lot of these things together. So that's not to disparage Guy Hamilton or Lewis Gilbert at all, whose work is amazing, but uh, it, is, it is a difference. And this being the fifth go-around, you know, Connery is already 
publicly, you know, and then finally confirms this is his last one. Um, so I think that that may, that puts an idea in people's heads, and then they look at the film, and it really departs from a lot of stuff, and it's really about these action set pieces and spectacles that, uh, you know, the story sort of takes a back seat and becomes less important. Um, you know, it makes everybody go back to, oh, well, he just didn't want to do it, and, uh, you know, Sean was tired, and he looks tired. I, again, I, I think that's a bit unfair. I, 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 I'm sure a lot of that stuff is going through his head, but um, I, I really do think when you look at these films seriously, I think if, if you had to name it, I think You Only Live Twice suffers from some of the Thunderball disease in terms of it being more about spectacle and, again, putting the cart before the horse being larger than life. It's also argued that this is really the point at which the Harry Saltzman Cubby Broccoli producing partnership that was the Eon partnership uh, that produced the films really fractured at this point. Um, by a certain time, they really uh, had gotten so bad off that they had to start alternating uh, who sort of took the reins and led on each production. And um, it, it's always been debated when this started, but it seems that it maybe really started on You Only Live Twice with uh, this film being more uh, heavily influenced and produced by Cubby Broccoli, and then uh, Harry Saltzman sort of taking the reins on, on, on Her Majesty's Secret Service and sort of going back and forth, uh, culminating in Man with the Golden Gun, which is the last film that they produced together. And that's an interesting notion to look at, because if, if you go along that, that thought process and you look at the, the sort of Cubby Broccoli ones and the Harry Saltzman ones, you notice that while Harry, Harry Saltzman always is known for having the crazy ideas and the off-the-wall ideas, the films that he had more influence in are actually the more grounded ones. And the ones that, uh, that Cubby supposedly had more uh, on set influence on, like this film, are much more about the spectacle. And to talk about spectacle, here the iconic moment of the magnet picking up the car and then dropping it in the bay. It's just got the perfect blend of larger than life and humor and everything. So it's just another one of the reasons why you can analyze this film to the cows come home and you can recognize its sort of uh, submerged identity as a Bond film if you want to look at it that way. It sort of has the slower rhythm, and, but the spectacle aspect is so larger than life that it's still a great film. It's an iconic film that is so fascinating to look at, but uh, again, the spectacle becomes more important than the story, and it's really at this point that 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 notion happens firmly and fully i think thunderball it starts to happen but i think with you live twice it it does completely and here we go from one great set piece into another great set piece and this of course is the kobe doc sequence which is also staged and uh directed in a in a different sort of fashion which adds to that sort of removed quality we see in certain periods. And that, of course, is the famous crane shot when Bond is running on the roof. For the first time in a Bond set piece, we pull away, we pull back, but it's built up to. And that starts right here when we see the forklift coming. And it's a nice suspense note. The editing is cut at the precise moment. And now we come into Barry's cue. If you listen to the soundtrack, the cue actually starts earlier, but I think the music editing in the early Bond films is so important to the to the emphasis and the impact of the score. And while this is, without question, probably John Barry's most beautiful score, it doesn't... Um, his action cues are just as impactful, and almost more so because they're intersposed with, this, with the beautiful melodies he comes up for uh, for the film. And here we have Aki going down the rope, Bond giving her cover, you know, sort of sacrificing himself so she can get away, which is a nice note of danger, but it, the film doesn't really go with that because here Bond is larger than life already. But again, we're having a nice establishing of rhythm. Bond is able to get to the roof, so it builds this sequence. I always love that shot there. They overlay the gunshot effect, and obviously he doesn't actually fire the, the prop. Now here is the crane shot, 
Uh, this was something that 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 uh, Lewis Gilbert went for. And we pull back, and everyone becomes a tiny speck on the roof. But you see all the figures going for the one suited figure. Again, Bond being the only one in a suit. And the, the music goes way into the epic stratosphere. So here we have Bond firmly established as a one-man army of sorts. But it doesn't go too far to discredit the character because, of course, Bond is still having to barely escape. And we have this wonderful double jump performed by Bob Simmons into the uh, packed mattresses and boxes. And, of course, he'll get off here and Connery will be on the other side and, of course, just pop up. So it's a wonderful cap to the sequence. And then what I've always loved is Bond gets away from everybody and then gets immediately knocked out. So it's like he went through all that effort and still gets captured. And, of course, he's done this so uh, he can get away and uh, get back to Tiger and at least say, okay, well, yeah, something's up. This, of course, is the confrontation scene on the Ningpo. And, again, we can see exactly how that uh, Helga Brandt is the film's Fiona Volpe. Again, repeating elements of Thunderball, right down to the fact that we get the dropped line from Thunderball, uh, which, of course, is the things I do for England, which will get reprised and become sort of a Bond trademark afterwards. That was originally in Thunderball. Uh, It was shot and removed in the scene where uh, Bond and Fiona start to uh, have fun in the bathroom, but you can see it in the trailer. However, I think it was wise to remove it for that film because, of course, Uh, Bond didn't need to admit that he was a spy. And here, uh, his cover story about being, you know, uh, from Empire Chemicals and things, well, he spins that into a story about, you know, stealing Osada's formula for making monosodium glutamate, which is something that a lot of people don't really read into. But if you pay attention to the dialogue here, Bond spins this whole story, a, a whole second cover, if you will, out of nothing. And it's wonderfully done because, of course, Sean is still playing it with his trademark bemused humor, you know. What's a nice girl like you doing at a place like this? Uh, so I have a confession to make. And, of course, here he says, I'm a spy. And he's playing with the notion that, you know, they know each other's game, but he's doing a second cover that he's making up on the spot. So, again, Bond is showing his intelligence, but he's also still probing exactly who this woman is and using his great, you know, for lack of a better term, his great sexual charm, which is, you know, a lot of ways his greatest weapon, being able to get information or change people's minds, things like that. Um, But it's this whole story that sets up the plane sequence, which is where, of course, Helgo Brandt will unsuccessfully try to kill Bond in an over-elaborate method when she could, of course, obviously just kill him here on the Ningpo, as she threatens to do by a torture first. And of course, this also sort of takes the place of the scene with Fiona and Thunderball as well. So I think the character of Helga is the point at which you can see the Thunderball influence the most in terms of construction and character and its influence on you little twice. And again, Roald Dahl was literally given the Thunderball script by the producers as this is how you write a James Bond film. But, uh, you know, outside of that, it's just something that gets stuck in your head. And once you notice it, you can't unnotice it. And we get the wonderful transition that goes right to the point at where her dress zipper is is done all the way down. You start to see the the tip of her underwear there. Now, of course, this is a optical for the outside of the plane, and it's a completely over elaborate uh, concept to kill Bond. But I love the line, you know, you'll need the best man we've got to be protected in Tokyo. And who do you suggest? Me. I do like the fact that she just jumps out, but the compositing is notoriously awful. And it's really the placement of of Helga when she pulls the parachute and it's Karen Dorr there. And and it's when the plane, it's superimposed over the plane going down. It's it's really terribly obvious. But uh, the tension is really built here. Here's the shot right there. That's that's the one. Um, But thankfully, it's very brief. 
I, I love that Bond uses a karate chop to break the board to get out, but this scene is really sold by the really intensive sound effects which uh, Norman Wanstall got by literally getting uh, a plane to just, you know, do death dives down to get this wonderfully intensive sound. And, of course, Bond is barely able to land the plane and crash land it before it explodes. And the editing is, is brilliant because, you know, it looks like Bond literally just barely gets out of there. Um, and it's a wonderful explosion. And, of course, by this point in time, you know, the, the Bond team could actually do a shot like that for real. Get a nice little repartee here. Uh, you know, Bond chasing girls. So there's a lot of sort of knowing lines about Bond and Bond's character in this film because at this point, everybody coming to the film should be, you know, firmly aware of Bond's stature and his character. Uh, even if they haven't seen a Bond film, they pretty much knew what they were buying their tickets for. Uh, if not knowing Bond, at least knowing the competition because at that point, the, the spy craze was everywhere and people knew Bond even if they'd never seen a Bond film. They knew the tropes because really it's Goldfinger and Thunderball that made Bond a public phenomenon. And to this day, when people say James Bond, they're thinking of the Goldfingerisms and the Thunderballisms even if they've never seen the film because it became so in, uh, entrenched in the public consciousness. And here, of course, is poor Desmond Llewell in his queue. Uh, I love the fact that Q is, is costumed in sort of military attire because he is once again on location to equip Bond. And we are introduced to Little Nelly for the first time, which, of course, was the uh, auto gyro, which was uh, designed and flown by uh, Wing Commander Ken Wallace. And the uh, production invented the gag of having it come in the four alligator suitcases, which is a wonderful touch. And we get this, uh, the wonderful building of Little Nelly, which is, you know, a total uh, maneuver in the editing lab. But it gives you the sense of not just how small this is, but it really shows off the auto gyro without doing a whole panning around or, or something that's really, really obvious. So that way the audience is able to realize what the heck this thing is, even if, you know, especially if they have no idea what it is, because again, most people in the 60s, or will not be very familiar with the Nando Gyro. And in a sort of reprise of the uh, itemizing of the DB5 gadgets in Goldfinger, we are introduced to all of the gadgets on Little Nelly. And if you listen closely there when Q talks about the two different types of missile launchers, I'm pretty sure that Desmond flips around what he's supposed to say because he points to the air-to-air -air missiles and says 60 a minute, and that should be referring to the, the canister rocket thing, the, the rocket pack. Um, but that's that may be just me. That's just always something I've, I've noticed. Um, this is just an amusing, fun little gag. And, of course, this little Nelly is real, and that's actually uh, Ken Wallace doing uh, all of the uh, the flying himself. And, of course, he would say, you know, you know for just... A handful of minutes, I did, you know, 80 takeoffs and landings. I was in the air for all these hours, but, you know, it was it was well worth it. And firmly entrenched in the public's mind, the amazing auto gyro. And it really has this, this, this opening of this sequence has this amazing sense of movement. Of course, Bond flies back over and everybody ducks down. But, of course, all these shots of Connery have to be process shots because they obviously weren't going to put Sean up there because it's a, a single, a one-man cockpit. Um, the matching is, is quite exceptional. You know, obviously that's not Sean, and, you know, especially because of the helmet, it definitely helps to hide everything. But it does, unfortunately, kind of make Bond look a bit static um, when, he, when we're in the process studio shots. And the shot there of Nelly going over the camera after that panoramic shot is just just beautiful. And here, John Barry is reprising his iconic 007 theme in the rendering he does for You Only Live Twice, which really suits the 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 adventure. The we're up in the air, zooming around, and it really gives you the sense of what it must be like to pilot one of these things over this astonishingly beautiful terrain. And of course. This is the real location, uh, and we're actually getting a, a getting it established here, which is really great because now, uh, you know, we can go through all this terrain and not have to establish it because it's already been done in the Little Nelly sequence. Now, it has to be wondered why they don't just let Bond go because by sending the helicopters after him, you know, that's going to cue in. Okay, 
um, now we've let people know that somebody's here. Now, obviously, they're intended to destroy Bond, and they probably don't know that it's Bond, but, you know, you have to think, you know, if they just let him go, then <laughs> they would just assume there's nothing there but volcanoes. Now, this is a phenomenal sequence in terms of the actual photography. It was very hard to do. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Johnny Jordan, who was the aerial cameraman, was severely injured uh, in, in this sequence, and they had to finish it later in Spain. But uh, there was an updraft, and basically the uh, rotors of the helicopter blades uh, wound up going through um, the... Um, the helicopter he was in and actually wound up uh, hitting his his leg, which later had to be amputated. Um, so th it was it was tragic that that happened, but uh, you know nothing is ever easy, and it's it's a testament that they were able to come back after that and just stage this very balletic movement of the helicopters in the auto gyro, which is very difficult to do. And coming up here is my favorite shot when we get going right over the camera with sort of a banking of both uh, Little Nelly and the helicopters. And of course, it's interspersed with process shots, which you know you obviously have to have. It's understandable, but again, you do get a sort of passivity in Bond here because he's obviously just flicking switches. Um, it's really helped, though, by Peter Hunt inserting the classic James Bond theme, which was something he loved to do, which, of course, drove, drove John Barry crazy because he would come up with cues and things. So I've always wondered what John Barry would have done for this sequence. I don't know if he had anything specifically composed for it, because when you listen to the score as released, even on the expansion, um, I'm not sure if any of those pieces were originally supposed to be over the Little, the little Nelly sequence or if it was um, maybe supposed to be... Uh, you know, just sound effects without music. There are some nice bits of actual footage. There's some of uh, of Wallace there, the over-the-shoulder shots, and the shot earlier of the uh, the Japanese pilot in the helicopter with Lil Nelly going underneath. That's what helps sell the sequence, and that's very similar to the uh, actual shots you get in From Russia with Love inside the helicopter as it's almost hitting Bob Simmons. So you you need those necessary bits of actual real location footage with everything moving. And again, I think the sequence is sold by the placement of the James Bond theme. So I think Peter Hunt was very right to get that in there because the sequence needs it because otherwise it, it's it's very similar. And you notice he's cutting it around as he would do to emphasize the drama. So here he cuts it so where the final bang is right when the missiles hit the helicopter. Which, of course, the explosion is a model with model trees. Now, this is roughly, you know, the half point of the film. So already we are pretty much half over. Because, again, you have to keep in mind you only live twice. Clock's in and under two hours. So... Uh, and again, this would not be the case for any Bond film until uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. And you got to think about it at this point, you know, already, you know, we, we have this this great, um, the idea, the plot, the, the stealing of the space capsules is a great plot. I love the plot. Interesting note here, if you look closely at the rocket launch here, and that's supposed to be the Soviet missile, you notice here, see the palm trees? Um, and then later on when we see the American launch, uh, it, basically what happened is the shots got reversed. So this is actually the American launch from Cape Canaveral, which is why there are palm trees in the shot, which is obviously not something you would see in a Soviet rocket launch in the 1960s. And if you look at the later sequence, uh, it is completely different and is actually the, the Russian rocket launching. I did not notice that for years until suddenly one day I noticed, why are there palm trees in Russia? That doesn't make any sense. And, you know, it, it was a mentioning firm. That is, that is a goof. So that's one of those, you spot, you, you spot it for the first time, and then it's like, oh, now I can't unsee it. So, again, now we're getting the second capture this time of the uh, Soviet capsule, which will further the tension because now one uh, capsule has been uh, taken from each side, which advances the plot because now each side is convinced it's the other one for sure because now the Soviet capsule has been taken. And we don't have to see everything because we've seen this happen before in the pre-title sequence. So we see shots, we see glimpses, and the tension builds as the dots on the radar get closer. So we have that built-in suspense because we've seen it before. And the music builds. It's different in character than it is in the pre-titles because now these, these, the, um, 
the evil scheme has increased in complexity. Now we've moved to stage two, as it were. So this is moving us closer and closer to the threat of global war because this was the height of the uh, space race still, which again is a part of history that unfortunately most people looking at the film today are not going to be as fully aware of. They're not living through it. So this is still a film in made in and set during the Cold War, which is very important. You always have to look at the historical context of the Bond films in particular. Now we get to see the actual rocket land, and this will confirm to the audience that Bond and MI6 and the British theory is on point, that the rocket is actually landing in Japan, and it lands exactly where Bond just flew over. But, you know, again, this sort of is the Thunderball formula again, because this is like the hijacking of the Vulcan and then landing it in the Bahamas and then having to wait for Bond to be able to discover it hidden away. So, again, we have sort of Thunderball creeping into the plot structure again. Now, again, the opticals here, all the special effects work. It can seem kind of hokey today. I know a lot of people like to complain about this sequence, but again, you have to keep in mind this all had to be done by hand, and the Bond films were not known for... They were not giant special effects films. Most most films weren't at this time. They would have some special effects, but they are much more uh, you know about practical effects. And here we have the a, astonishing reveal of one of the greatest film sets in motion picture history, which is Ken Adams' uh, masterful... A volcano crater rocket base and we see the outside first it's dark and the crater starts to pull back if you look at that shot closely the optical the outside the perspective is kind of off because the helicopter pad looks huge but when we first go inside we pull back as the the lid if uh, if you want to call it that starts to open so as this opens we pull back to give you the full scale and what really helps sell it is the fact you see real people running around and driving around because otherwise you you wouldn't get the same sort of scale. You need people moving around in the monorail and things. Now this set I've always loved. If you look very closely, it is a full-on almost triangle shape, which is very much in keeping with with Ken Adam and his Doctor Strange love set, and it's also got echoes of the Goldfinger Rumpus Room set, but. It's interesting, all the, the U.S. officials sit around and look down at these monitors. It's just a really interesting idea. I don't know how he came up with this. It's also interesting, if you look closely at the guy who pops up on the uh, television monitor there, I believe it is the same actor who pops up in uh, Diamonds Are Forever at the um, uh, White Tektronics uh, rocket control uh, board. The, the, uh, uh, the famous man wearing glasses saying, it doesn't make sense. Again, if you want to poke holes with the effects here, you obviously can on the optical work. But here as we cut in to the actual base, you know, this is a real practical prop being lowered down. And it's really enhanced by all the steam and they've cleared the area because, you know, you obviously don't want to be standing around when when a rocket lands. It is so well done that it really sells the believability of this plot and again, nothing like this had ever been attempted before. If it had, it was all, you know, they tried to do it with models, which you could, but it's astonishing that they really did this. And in the in the pre-digital era, you know, the amount of work and scale and money that went into this, I mean, this is so impressive that as impressive as the photography is, you know, it still, I don't think, captures the the power of this and people who were who had actually got to walk on this set say the same thing um i've often wondered what the film would look like if ted moore had shot it i think it would still be excellent but you know i think without having ted moore i think you know uh, getting freddie young was the best idea in the world because you needed somebody who could do something that large and of course getting the man who shot lawrence of arabia you know that that was a master stroke uh, to photograph this set. And it totally makes sense why uh, he and Lewis Gilbert thought it would be a good idea to shoot the film in Super Panavision 70. And one has to wonder what a 70 millimeter um, large format Bond film would be like. Uh, you know, it would it would have made sense to do this film in large format, but uh, that was something apparently the producers were just never really interested in. So uh, it's amazing how, how well photographed this set is. Because again, you could have 
the biggest set in the world, but if if your uh, cinematographer wasn't up to the challenge, as it were, uh, it would be totally worthless. You could have just made a model, and it would have been just as effective. So, again, the the lighting, the photography, and the larger than life set really sells this. You know, it sells the enormity of of, of Spectre's plot, although. Technically, it's not exactly Spectre's plot, which we'll get here in this next scene, you know, because it's all a scheme where we have the red Chinese agents who have, uh, you know, basically paid and supplied Spectre to do this. Spectre is really the the um, the operating entity. And this this scene establishes this and gives us the full scale of the plot, because, of course, they are doing this to initiate World War III between the competing world powers. So then they will basically, you know, destroy each other, leaving the uh, Chinese government, as it were, to assume, uh, you know, greater leadership on the world stage. We're establishing the Piranha Pool here, which will serve as the demise of Helga Brandt and one of the most iconic uh villain accoutrements in any any story whatsoever and what i've loved about this for so many years is blofeld is giving it right back to them and using the core tenement of the name specter and actually extorting the chinese agents because he realizes he does have them over a barrel they help supply everything they helped build the rocket base but they can't do anything about Spectre coming back and extorting them because they can't do anything about it, so they have to give in. And Blofeld knows this. Of course, we have returned to the uh, unseen Blofeld. Of course, we will see Blofeld unmasked as Donald Pleasance, but it does build the impact because the reveal is held to the very end. And I still feel to this day the most effective Blofeld is the unseen Blofeld we have in From Marshall with Love and Thunderball. So it's a nice nod to the Terrence Young era in that sense, but it's also perfect drama. And that is the shot of the PPK from Osato's office that obviously must have been passed on to Spectre HQ. And Blofeld immediately realizes that Bond is alive. And that also, you know, shows he is the criminal mastermind and a great threat that Bond is up against and doesn't quite realize it yet. This is an element of Fleming's novel. It's one of the few elements that makes it through with, you know, Blofeld being at the heart of the uh the plot as it were and bond having to come up against him after infiltrating the fortress so that's one of the few core elements of the novel that does make it through and here is one of the most iconic deaths and that is actually karen door in the water going in she did that herself which does add to the believability of of the scene and it's one of those things, especially when you see this film as a kid, it's a larger than life moment that just burns itself into your brain. And with Osado's, yes, number one, yes, yes, it gives that nice element of humor that's always necessary to undercut the intensive drama of something like that that happens right before. This is another one of the transitional moments. It's that same uh, cue that I love so much from Barry Score. It does set up the more languid pacing of the whole ninja school sequence so it is it is another example of john barry just knowing exactly what to do for every single moment of a bond film it's really something he's not given the credit for he knows exactly the pacing the tempo the tone to go for and you see he's he's doing light underscoring through here and he's he's keeping everything other, you know, you know, in the in the Japanese idiom, he's created musically, but he's keeping everything moving along, literally moving along as they're walking along. Because without the music, this would, you know, be quite boring. But it does set up the establishment of this is my ninja training school, and of course, this was a totally larger than life for 1967 audiences. Although now it, it seems a, a, a bit silly, you know, this was still long before the Kung Fu craze. So we see some martial arts, we see the uh, sword play, the sort of uh, kendo swordsmanship. Uh, you know, this was really selling the point that 
Bond was going somewhere he had never been before, and you're getting to go along for the ride. This film is a ride. And it kind of doesn't make any sense why we're getting on this, actually. The whole notion of ninjas at the end is something that was uh, a holdover from the Harold Jack Bloom script, and everything I've seen referencing that, uh, you know, I've seen some discussion of it. It does seem like it kind of, that script maybe went off the deep end a little bit in terms of the completely ridiculous over the topness. Um, and of course, it doesn't get much more over the top than a final battle with an army of ninjas. But it is amazing spectacle that you just don't forget. And again, you you see this for the first time, and you, you've never quite seen that before. You don't get a giant battle with an army of ninjas at the end of every film. But again, it must be taken into account. This was, you know, very much new for 1967 audiences, still larger than life. But this is the point at which the film really starts to drag. And we get the whole notion of, Oh, Bond must train to be a ninja and become, uh, disguised as Japanese and must train for days before, uh, you know, inserting themselves onto the Island to check it out. It really doesn't make much sense because why would they do this? They don't know if Spectre really is on the island. They don't even know if it's Spectre for sure. And why are they wasting time with the uh, countdown ongoing, which eventually does get moved up? Now, these rocket guns were um, were real. They were supplied by the great friend to the series, uh, Charles Ruchon, who was the American military liaison. Um, and interestingly enough, if you listen to all the uh, extras and things, he literally brought them over in his airline back, um, just full of these these um, rocket guns and things. And that was that was like a miniature cue scene because, of course, it shows the uh, Bond getting the 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 cigarette rocket, which, of course, will play a heavily uh, a large part in the uh, finale which is almost a reference in a way in Tomorrow Never Dies when uh, Bond gets things from the uh, from Waylon's uh, arsenal in the bike shop. And here is the wedding sequence being set up. I love how, how disappointed Aki is here. Um, she's so wonderfully resourceful throughout the film. And of course, uh, Akiko Wakabayashi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and probably not, um, was originally supposed to play Kissy Suzuki, but uh, switched roles with Mia Hama when um, uh, Hama was not very proficient in English, so they switched roles um, because Aki has um, a, a lot more dialogue. Now, this is the strangest moment of the film, the disguising of Bond as Japanese very unconvincingly. But uh, that whole set is iconic and far more intricate than it needs to be. But it's just, you know, Ken Adam having fun. Um, so basically, the extent of Bond's Japanese disguise is a very bad hairpiece, some eyepieces, and um, Sean kind of bending over some and saying one or two phrases of Japanese not very well. Um, it's extraordinarily unconvincing. Uh, it doesn't make any sense why we're doing this. Uh, Bond in the novel disguises himself because um, Tiger Tanaka asks him to infiltrate the uh, Castle of Death, which is um, owned by a Dr. Shatterhand, who, of course, Bond realizes is Blofeld. Um, but there's a reason for it in the novel, whereas in the film, none of this really needs to be here. However... I will go with all of that for this sequence. It sets up the death, uh, death of Aki by the poison string, which is, I do not know how they came up with this, but it is one of the most striking, haunting moments in the entire series. Um, it is uh, beautifully shot, beautifully scored by John Barry. Um, I'm still amazed at how well they're able to get the, the actual droplets of the poison going down on the string um, and the way that they make it glisten and the way that they're able to get the string to show up over the, the two shot of uh, Bond and Aki there. And it really is a hairy position for Bond because he literally does almost get killed. It's only by mere chance that Aki takes the, the poison inadvertently and dies for Bond becoming the film's sacrificial lamb. Here's the shot again. The way that the, the poison glistens in the light as it goes down on the string. And and John Barry's cue is so heart-stoppingly suspenseful. And we get that 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 droning bass content that comes in, those those whooshes. 
And Ian turns away. And then, of course, Aki ever so conveniently moves directly over un- under the string. And just, it just takes one drop. And, of course, then the, the guy is like, oh, crap. And he's crawling out, which is a, something I've always thought was inadvertently hysterically funny. And then Bond just shoots him. And, of course, Bond, as Bond would, always has a gun in bed. That's, that's something I've always loved about this scene as well. And at first he has to make sure that the man is dead. And then we hear Aki's final words. She tries to she tries to say something. And we see that Bond is genuinely moved. And it's, you know, really a horrible way to go so suddenly. And it's it's a very somber mo- uh, a moment that really gives great gravitas to the the film that it really does need. And of course, it is the same fate that Paula had in Thunderball, if you want to go back to the influence of Thunderball. But it's felt a lot more here because Aki's been so uh, such a participant in events going on that you feel truly sad. It's one of the most effective um, sacrificial lambs in the whole series. And uh, that is part of the Bond formula that I think is actually really important, uh, you know, definitely an element of, of the spy genre really grounds every story and um it's it's something that i think should be as discussed as much as you know the bond girls and the q scenes and stuff but uh doesn't quite get there now you have to wonder how the uh, specter assassin got into the ninja school how he infiltrated it and also if they did this then they obviously know that bond is there so why do they stay there and continue training you know it's a good thing you only live twice moves so fast because when you stop to think about some of these things, it makes no sense. That's why it's so important to keep things moving along because if you stop to think about what's going on, you're like, wait, what? Why? I don't understand your logic. Um, now, you can do that with almost any movie, but I think You Only Live Twice is the first film you can, in the series you can do that um, a heck of a lot of the time. And... Uh, I mean, yes, it's a problem in a way, but it's, uh, you know, this film, again, it is a spectacle. It is a shifting of focus. And now we're getting the wedding sequence, which is beautifully put together, beautifully scored, beautifully shot. But you have to wonder why exactly we're going through this. Was this scene necessary? And ultimately, no, it isn't. Um, you know, it's it's beautiful um for giving a greater insight into aspects of Japanese culture, for sure. But, you know, plot-wise, it doesn't make much sense why this is here. And we do have a nice bit of humor with the the first women that come up and, you know, their faces are revealed. And, you know, as Tiger has told Bond, you know, Kissy has a face like a pig. But it is paid off here when we see Kissy for the first time in this breathtaking close-up. The first time we see Mihama and she looks up, and her eyes see Bond for the first time, and John Barry's music just swells. I mean, it's just, it's another one of those moments that does just make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Again, I think John Barry outdoes himself yet again. I think starting with, with Thunderball, really, he moves into the stratosphere of just being untouchable. I think... You know, for much with Love and Goldfinger are amazing scores, but they still were very early scores for him as a film composer. And I really think starting with Thunderball that he he started making these scores and they became epic in nature. And I think in a lot of ways, Under Majesty's Secret Service uh, musically sort of marries elements of the Thunderball and You Only Live Twice scores. One, and, you know, on one side the romance, and on one side the epic adventure scale. So again, I, I think the the music of You Only Live Twice and the photography are so important to selling this film as a larger than life spectacle, and. That's what You Only Live Twice is at its core, which in a lot of ways is in direct contrast to Fleming's novel, which in in most ways is actually bonded as most human and as most naked. Uh, he is a broken man. He is a failure of an agent. He's sent on a last-ditch mission because, of course, the novel takes place after Honor Majesty's Secret Service, where, of course, at the end, um, Tracy Bond, wife of James Bond for a few short moments, is brutally murdered by Blofeld and Bond is destroyed. 
Of course, Under Majesty's Secret Service was supposed to be done as a Bond film much earlier than this. Uh, originally, it was going to follow Goldfinger, but things happened, and then they were able to strike a deal with Kevin McClory and went ahead and did Thunderball. Then again, Under Majesty's Secret Service was supposed to come next, and then again, more complications arose, even though um, in both instances, original prints did advertise the next Bond film as being Under Majesty's Secret Service. Um, they even did a promotion after Thunderball trying to find uh, girls to portray the uh, the girls in the, um, uh, the health clinic, the allergy clinic that Blofeld sets up. They did a whole publicity campaign uh, trying to find uh, women to do those parts, but uh, that, of course, was abandoned. So... Uh, eventually they decided to do You Only Live Twice as the next film, and uh, that meant doing the stories out of order and just basically uh, ignoring the continuity of the novels, which, you know, there there's a sort of loose continuity, but until you get to um, Under Majesty's Secret Service and You Only Live Twice, that's really where it matters very much that you do the stories in order. And, of course, the films just, you know, because they did You Only Live Twice first, it meant that, you know, it, it, it totally undoes it as being the uh, more human, more poetically minded aftermath of Bond as a shell of a man having to basically uh, regain his sense of self over the course of the story because, you know, uh, in contrast, the You Only Live Twice novel opens with Bond and Tiger Tanaka sitting around getting increasingly drunk in a geisha house playing uh, a long game of rock, paper, scissors. So um, that in and of itself tells you that the novel is extremely different, plus the uh, Fortress of Blofeld is a castle on the Japanese coast uh, filled with the most toxic, uh, poisonous uh, elements of nature to the point that it is a garden of death where all of the um, uh, those in Japan who are um, suicidal go to um, kill themselves. And Blofeld is basically holed up there under an assumed alias and in ways has gone mad after his many failures. And uh, is basically, um, Bond finds him almost by coincidence. Tanaka asks him to go there and, uh, you know, figure out what's going on and, you know, kill this guy if necessary. And that's how Bond will achieve his mission he's been sent there to do by MI6 in the novel it's it's very different and it takes a long while to get there there's a lot of bond's character being dissected throughout um so again the novel is very different but in some ways i do think some of that spirit does find its way into the film even though the film is the first time we are totally throwing out the novel if if you want to really look at it it seems like this you know they're they're quiet bond is introspective He's, you know, staring at Kissy. There's nothing they can do at this moment. So there there are little sort of spiritual flourishes, I think, of the novel. But I think you do have to look very hard for those. And it may be just me uh, trying to look for those. But I've always felt a little bit of that. And then when I finally did read the novel growing up for the first time, I did sort of make that association, so I've always felt that way. There is some of the novel's DNA in the film, even though the story goes, you know, wildly in its own direction. And now we are getting to the point where uh, Tiger comes up and they have uh, moved up the launching date for the American rocket. So this this is starting to put the pressure back on. But it's he says that, and now we don't really ever mention it again. So now it's back, and the plot is in the background again. So now it's all about we got to go check out the volcano. So again, the the plot, the actual ticking time clock aspect is is not always at the forefront. Now this moment here, the launching of the Ama fishing fleet in the morning, at at daybreak with. John Barry's Q, which on the um, soundtrack release is aptly titled Mountains and Sunsets. I mean, this is just agonizingly beautiful. Uh, again, it's moments like this that make this film magical. You can have problems with the story all day long, but no no films on, on average have moments like this. So again, this film being a spectacle... It, it does start to sort of make up for some of the inherent shortcomings of of the plotting and the 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 narrative focus not being as strong as the early films um, because the early films couldn't have this this notion of spectacle they didn't have the budget they didn't have the time they didn't have the manpower they weren't popular enough 
And we've seeged into this nice scene uh, going into the Rizaki cave, which has this wonderful sense of foreboding. And again, Bond is very quickly able to detect the, uh, you know, gosh, keep the visitors away. Um, and he realizes it like a nanosecond. So it's really interesting that he's able to do that very quickly. But of course, again, it's always important to show Bond as the intelligence man and being having to think 5, 10, 15 steps ahead of everybody else on screen. Otherwise, you know, he'd be dead in a few more seconds. Like the uh, the funeral of the girl who we saw before, because Bond saw that, you know, they knew to go check the cave out, and he knew that there was a reason she died. So that smell, he's able to put two and two together really fast. And he's already talking about the sulfur on the walls, which ties him in. Uh, mentally, he's able to put two and two together again and deduce that there's a tunnel working up there and they need to go check this out because, of course, there would have to be something nefarious going on for somebody to have a lethal trap to keep locals away and already have killed at least one person, if not several. The editing in here, editing in here is, is very good at keeping this moving. Um, again, it is good that we still have Peter Hunt uh, but um, originally, he was not the editor of the film and had actually left the production. He wanted to direct this film. Uh, he had wanted to move into to directing after Thunderball. But um, uh, in you know his version, you know he kind of got fed up when uh, they went with Lewis Gilbert instead, and then was convinced to come back and do the second unit. But um, Lewis Gilbert and the interim had brought on another editor, and Peter Hunt did the second unit. But then you know really felt that the the other editor wasn't doing it in the the sort of rhythmic style he had established on the earlier films so eventually he he sort of took over and um you know i i do think that his editing is so integral to the bond identity as 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 films that um, you know, when he did leave the series after Automatic Secret Service, I think it was one of the great critical losses of the entire series um, because immediately in Diamonds Are Forever, you can feel the difference. But I think him knowing that he had to keep the film tight, I think if this film was over two hours, I think it would be unbearable in some ways uh, because it does have a more languid pace. It does have that more of that travelogue aspect. It is a spectacle, but because he's got it cut so tight, because it's under two hours, he does maintain that all-important sense of movement. Now, there again is that optical again when the crater closes. If you look, the optical of the actual interior, that is that is the one one moment. When you see it earlier when the rocket is landing at night, and when you see it there when the crater is closing again, those are, the, the, that's, those are the two brief instances of effects that really always stand out to me as they, they don't quite work because the perspective isn't quite right of the... Um, the interior, but that's something you, you, it's so brief that you're only going to notice it if you're like me and you've watched this film a thousand times or more. Um, again, beautiful location photography of the actual volcano crater and you get the scale of it. So that way it matches well with the, um, all the stuff on the Pinewood stages. Uh, they're able to very well, um, mix those together now here's the shot of the of the rocket lifting off and this was supposed to be the soviet rocket so again no palm trees so it would be really cool um i wish obviously they would have realized in time been able to flip them uh and put this earlier in the film and then have the other one later but um really without the palm trees in the first one you wouldn't really know that because uh you know it's obviously just you know model shots but um that's just uh, once you realize that it still cracks me up every time because that's a total goof now here we're on a set at pinewood and uh it's really amazing how well they were able to recreate the uh, the rocky terrain the the sort of molten uh, you know uh, calcified fossilized molten aspect and then the the actual texture of the paint on the actual crater top is is really well done and it looks so realistic that when um bond actually steps out on it you know you have to wonder for a second you know and because he says oh they're they're usually very deep and then once he steps on it you know for sure now it's been confirmed bond knows that okay this is something i've never encountered before and it's at that precise moment that the crater opens. 
it's slightly inherently humorous that you know it's opening with Bond standing on. He's sort of looking around like, what do I do now? And of course, the helicopter is coming out to scout around for any would-be, uh, you know, any locals that would be looking around. Now that optical, when you see inside close up, that one is done perfectly. I wish the earlier ones had been done as well. And that's the shot where Bond knows, okay, it's it's go time now. You know, tell tell Tiger to come back here with every man he's got. And I like that Bond is already prepared and sort of battle fatigues, which, of course, is the outfit the ninjas will wear. And he even has the sort of ninja hood. So he has been fully indoctrinated into this, although it does look a little silly for, for Connery to be in the sort of a gray hood mask. And the notion of using the, the suction cups to, to get down the wall, again, it's been spoofed. It's become a cliche of sorts. But, you know, this was still you know, relatively... And, you know, definitely new territory for, uh, you know, uh, even a film in the late 60s. And, uh, you know, it is a novel way for Bond to get infiltrate the base because coming in for the top, you know, there's not really anything you can do. And, of course, later on, the ninjas will have to use ropes to slide down. And, of course, uh, they're using a lot of camera angles to suggest the notion of height. Um, this, of course, the the long shots are, are uh, you know, st- a stuntman going down but then the closer shots of sean uh it's just you know he's having to really perform it but he's obviously on a, on a flat surface and it's being uh surface and it's being cheated by the camera angle it's done very well it's a, it's a very brief thing because bond is of course just going down to where he can get to the uh, top staircase and this becomes another moment where bond is having to infiltrate a facility but for, for the first time it is one of the larger than life ken adam facilities so He's having to sneak around and observe the monorails, the elevator, the working elements, and figure out his plan of attack, which is, you know, key. This is a moment of stealth. And he's having to still figure out how Spectre is achieving all of this because this film is still a mystery, just like Thunderball was. Um, But, of course, the stakes are, you know, even greater because, of course, instead of it just being two atomic bombs, it's risking, you know, global thermal nuclear war at this point. And again, again, because this is the third time now we're seeing the space capsule, we don't have to have as much footage. So we see the space capsule less and less and less because we already know what's going on. We know what's at stake. We know what Spectre is going to do. And we know what's going to happen if Bond fails to stop the whole missile going off, uh, let alone um, stop it from capturing the final capsule because... As it's been stated in the film, if this goes off, it will practically ignite what becomes World War III. But again, still there's this sort of sedate quality going on. Uh, Again, because the plot has taken a back seat throughout the entire film, this is more of we're just blown away by this, this experience. And the shots there at Bond when he sneaks on the monorail... I've always loved the sort of documentary feel, the sort of first-person perspective there. We get a little bit of uh, handheld camera shake there, just just enough to put us in uh, Bond's position, crouched there underneath the, the tarp on the monorail, which is really helpful to sell the, um, the um, you-are-there-ness of the scene. And here Bond has to flatten against the wall as, as another cart comes around, which is a nice touch. And, of course, the monorail actually did work, which is astonishing. And the humor of Bond just walking up to, to these guys who have been, been stuck in this prison all this time. And, of course, their response, who the hell are you? Also love the fact that, you know, the um, surviving U.S. and uh, Russian astronauts had just been, you know, hanging out, chilling, swapping stories and finding, uh, you know, uh, a sort of common ground as they're stuck in this prison. So it, that's, a, that's a very minor thing, but if you look closely, they're just hanging out talking. <laughs> so, I mean, what else are they going to do? And now Kissy will have to make it back to Tanaka, but fittingly, because she is an almond diving girl, when she goes under the water, she's able to go under for long enough to make it look as if uh, she has been uh, shot dead and has just, you know, um, sunk under the waves, as it were. 
so you know uh, as as a character she does show some spirit and uh you know some of the necessary spunk uh as uh, but uh in in sequences like this and earlier when she refuses bond's advances and insists on being about business but you know outside of that we don't have the same uh, you know, soul that's in uh, Fleming's Kissy Suzuki. But of course, uh, the Kissy in the film is much more of a minor character, has a lot less to do. Uh, but it's really those the those two key things and the fact she does, uh, you know, follow into the battle and does participate some, uh, rather improbably still in her, biki- her iconic white bikini. <laughs> Well, so that was funny seeing Bond in the the sort of white outfit. Uh, of course, fittingly, he's having to infiltrate this, but uh, th- this room. But it's you know kind of funny seeing him in the uh, enemy uniform. That would be compounded by, because he will now uh, put on the astronaut suit, because the initial plan of Bond is to actually take command of the rocket himself. And uh, seeing later that uh, Blofeld's plan is to blow up the rocket to destroy it, uh, Bond would be sacrificing himself, which is ostensibly what he intends to do here he obviously has no idea how to pilot a rocket so i don't exactly know what the plan is here uh you know uh, you know the rocket may be on um automatic liftoff controls but bond won't know that for sure so if he infiltrates and makes it into the rocket um how's he going to pilot it how's he going to pass himself off how's he going to control it properly he's really risking everything at this point So this is the most suspenseful moment of the film because Bond is putting himself into mortal danger. He is risking everything. And right out here in the open, the only thing that uh, saves him is, of course, he is, uh, you know, clothed in an astronaut helmet. But, of course, if you look closely, he is still obviously taller than most people around. So um, if the guy had been Japanese, they would already be wondering, okay, why is he now two feet taller? But, again... There is music builds in intensity, and Bond gets all the way to the rocket door and actually starts to swing in. So we're really ratcheting everything up because Bond, at this point, it looks like, oh, my God, Bond is going to go into space. We're in uncharted territory, and we get all the way to right as they're going to close the doors. And it's only when he, at that point, he makes a mistake by putting in the air conditioner. That's what gives him away, and that's what Blofeld spots. But it is important to note that that is uh, such a suspenseful moment because, you know, for a brief second there, Bond was going to go into space 12 years before Moonraker. And that would have really been something uh, because, of course, you know, Bond would not go into space until Moonraker. But interestingly, it is cool to note that the decision was made to keep everything grounded, keep Bond on the ground, and not go too far into fantasy land. So I actually do really appreciate it. I do think it was a wise move to do that because, again, Bond couldn't really sell himself as an astronaut, which is what happens here, of course. And, of course, Bond is revealed, which is a fun reveal to see the villain's reaction, to see Osado's reaction. And now we get the final reveal of Blofeld. Donald Pleasance with his iconic scar, which uh, some people have compared to a cracked egg. (laughs) And now we get the usage of the film's title, which is always a wonderful thing if you pull it off right, because it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, because when you say the film's title in a film, it's usually so on the nose that it takes you out of the movie. But the way that Blofeld says it, the way Donald Pleasance reads it, this cold uh, distance he has, he feels otherworldly, and of course the image sells it. Uh, it. It's this directness he has in the part that really sells it. And, of course, originally they had a different actor. Uh, I believe his name was uh, Jan Varick or Werwick. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Um, but, you know, it was felt he was totally the wrong type. And there are some images of him. He did shoot for some time on the set, I think about a week, before they realized they had they really needed to replace him. And, uh, thankfully, Donald Pleasance was available. Um it is iconic imagery-wise. You see the cat. You get the the Chairman Mao brown suit, the black chair, uh, the scar, the bald head, everything. It's become uh, totally ingrained in the public consciousness. But um, 
they've still debated. Everybody has their own favorite uh, Blofeld performance, uh, particularly out of the the three successive Blofelds of uh, Donald Pleasance, uh, Telly Sabalas, and Charles Gray, which sort of formed the Blofeld trilogy, uh, which is uh, similar to what happens in the novels, but of course they're done out of order in the films, and you know this film is completely different. Again, now the suspense is building up again because now the rocket launch is proceeding and what's great about this sequence, what makes it work, is Bond can do nothing to stop it. And he's stuck in the control room under guard and must watch as a helpless onlooker, which is really what what you need to do. We've upped the stakes again. Bond's original at- attempt has failed and now he has to see the villain succeed without being able to do a thing. And the editing picks up here really wonderfully as the the final seconds tick away. And then we cut to the announcer, which was really a wonderful touch. And we get a little closer. And I've always loved, you know, the precise lip movements the announcer has. It just really sells it. Plus, we hear the ticking of the clock. And again, I'm, I'm always so... Um, amazed at how well that the shots work of the actual life-size rocket there is uh, you know a, a tiny bit of model usage here and there and of course now we're into uh you know the opticals the the tail fire is is a bit you know it is a bit iffy but again you do have to give this film credit because again the bond films were not uh, you know heavy with optical usage and uh, it was still a very difficult thing to do for films of this era now, this shot coming up here is, for me, the most amazing of the film. When Tiger waves his arm and signals the ninja army, and they all rise up on the volcano, and it's this shot here when the music crescendos and they all line up on the ridge. This is one of the most great moments of adventure and spectacle in any film for me and is the moment that always never fails to just make me just, you know, gasp in awe, if you want to put it that way. Once again, we're getting abbreviated returns to the Spectre rocket here. It's been decorated with the star and markings of the Soviet Uh, insignia which again will help to signal that it is okay it's it's a russian uh, ship capturing an american ship and it confirms the whole idea the specter is trying to plant in everyone's minds of course how the americans would see the markings on the ship i have no idea but uh, at least they were covering all their bases and this is a nice moment here because, you know, Bond thinks his ace in the hole is uh, Tiger coming in with, you know, his forces. But, uh, of course, Blofeld has every avenue covered and has, you know, enough fire ne- firepower to annihilate a small army. So now Bond's ace in the hole is, is wiped out. He doesn't know that Tiger's going to get there. He, they do get there, and Bond thinks, okay, I have a way out, but now they've been stopped. So this sets up the usage of the uh, cigarette rocket because Bond has to get uh, an opening for them. And it, it, that, that's why this sequence is so important because without this, you know, okay, well, they're just going to stay up there and get massacred and, and then Bond is on his own again. So again, now the cigarette's coming into play and as every Bond gadget should be, it's been set up. And so when it finally gets pulled, we're waiting for it, and then it goes off, and now we have to relieve that suspense. Bond is able to get the crater open just enough for just long enough that we're able to get some guys in, and then they're finally able to blow a charge from the underside. Of course, since they lay a charge, you have to wonder why didn't they just try to do it on the top, but um, at least they got past some, some of them got past the crater guns. Also begs the question, how did uh, Bond and Kissy not get spotted earlier if they uh, spotted the ninja army really quickly at night in battle fatigues, you know, uh, being very stealthy? uh, How did they not spot Bond and Kissy sneaking around in broad daylight? Um, Again, there's a lot of incongruities you can spot if you really want to question it. Of course, uh, I think they practically had every British stuntman they could get for this sequence, uh, you know, doing... Uh, the rope slides and everything, um, in addition to a lot of the um, a lot of the performers we saw in the uh, ninja school sequence. 
So we'll see those guys come into play again. In particular, uh, everybody's favorite, the Swordsman. And what's really great about these stunts here, uh, when you see the guys flying around, again, they talk, this, talk about this in a lot of the extras, but uh, it was a particular technique that was developed where they're actually bouncing off of trampolines to give that sort of uh, forward movement, to give that, that propulsion sense of being propulsed, uh, thrown away from the explosions, which really helps to um, sell them. And then the long wide shots of all of the ninjas coming out at the same time. I mean, you, 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 this film is a spectacle. You cannot get away from that. Um, and you will see this get uh, reprised. And of course, the, um, the final battle of the spy who loved me, uh, again, being directed by Lewis Gilbert. So this, this really is, it, it's, you know, obviously an extension of the underwater climax of Thunderball, but it's, you know, the first of the gigantic larger than life uh, one army versus another army inside the great fortress uh, battles that ends a Bond film. Uh, they, you know, only do this a handful of times, really, but it's become iconic. Here's the swordsman. I've always thought it was interesting. If you listen to the sound effects, it's always the same uh, sound effect of like the the blade hitting metal or something, which I always thought was funny. Um, that's the sound effect even when it goes through flesh, even when he stabs the guys or he cuts them. It's that same sound effect. Uh, that's one of those sound effects is burned into my brain along with the 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 gunshots which are um some of the same wonderful effects that you hear in the earlier bond films there they they go throughout uh you know the the whole series but um uh, again just wonderful down to the sound design and we get the payoff of the joke you know Blofeld says earlier it's impregnable. And there, if you look at the cat, the cat is literally losing its mind. And you see Donald Plus is having to hold on to it. And they had a lot of trouble because at one point they did lose the cat because it ran away and hid. Of course, here at the control desk, that is the wonderful uh, Bert Kwok, who also appeared in Goldfinger as Mr. Ling and uh, would famously play Cato in the Pink Panther films. There's Shane Rimmer again in the uh, in the footage, and of course, if you look at the shots of the planes, it's obviously uh, stock footage, which you can see, even see the film scratches on it. This is the wonderful bit of misdirection about the price of failure, where Bond is finally going to be killed. Oh no, we're killing Osato instead, and you have to wonder why he doesn't just go ahead and kill Bond. And there's the cat. The cat jumps out because it's the gunshot terrifies it, so it's just like, no, I'm getting out of here. So. <laughs> So I guess uh, Blofeld's cat is uh, abandoned and uh, left to fend for itself and the uh, uh, volcano base. And then Bond is saved at the 11th hour. Uh, you know, it's beautifully strung out just enough uh, where he gets saved by Tiger throwing the uh, throwing star. And, of course, Blofeld is able to just zoom off on his monorail and, and live to uh, try for world domination again some other day. And it, again, sets the tone of Blofeld just abandoning the, abandoning everybody in the base when uh, all things go wrong. And uh, seeing all the con control room technicians going through uh, Blofeld's uh, parlor, as it were, is a really fun touch. And of course, they're heading for the rear exit, which is how uh, Bond realizes he can get to the control room. This, of course, is later brought back uh, in, in a similar fashion in The Spy Who Loved Me when Bond can't uh, obviously go through to the control room. Uh, it's even more, it's truly impregnable in that film, but uh, that's why they then uh, Bond comes up with the notion of using the uh, nuclear detonator, the warhead detonator. Now there, if you look closely at Connery's breath, it's uh, you know obviously showing the fact that this entire set was freezing cold because, of course, it was on the back lot at Pinewood where you could see it for miles around. It was just exposed steel girders on the outside. But uh, you know, shooting this sequence, uh, you see the, the foggy breath a few times, but particularly when, when Sean is crouched in front of the oil drums. Um, so it obviously was <laughs> rather cold <laughs> during this whole sequence. I do love the fact that Bond runs out of bullets here and has to resort to using the throwing stars. It adds a nice element of danger. And again, we're going back to Bond picking up the elements of, of ninjadom. I've always felt this set does have a little bit of Dr. No's uh, set in it. You see the painting there and the uses of the rock walls. Now, this, this 
start of the fight, when we build, we go into Hans here, we get this nice little crash zoom into Bond. It's a great way to start a fight. And we go into this wonderfully vivid John Barry cue. And again, you know, we're getting elements of the room thrown around. It's it's a short fight, but it does have a nice intensity that builds up. I wish it was I wish it had a little bit more to it because it's so wonderfully done. But at this point, it's the climax. So Bond has to get up there fast. There is the ticking clock. Um, but because that's always taken a back seat for most of the plot, the, I wish this fight, you know, had a little bit more going on. But it's wonderfully staged uh, and, of course, gets climaxed and Bond using his iconic judo throw to take Hans into the piranha pool. With a beautiful send-off from John Barry and Bon Appetit. And it's got that quickness because, of course, Bond has to get up and stop the rocket. Of course, we do have the countdown timer. This is basically going back to the uh, stopping of the bomb and Goldfinger, Bond against the clock. But it is a little bit awkward because if you look, Bond's big struggle is not with Hans in the fight, but trying to get the exploder button control open. He just has to turn the key, but it's it's stuck. So it's kind of inherently funny, but it's also Bond has to struggle. He has to go through the whole film, and there you can see those planes are stock footage. Um but you see there with the key, his whole battle, the fate of the world rests on Bond can't get the key to open. <laughs> so it's kind of funny in that way it, once, once you look at it in that sense. But it is nice and dramatic because it gets right down to the wire and the music builds and then climaxes right when he hits the button. But of course, the explosion is so close to the, um, the U.S. space capsule that you have to wonder, well, wouldn't that have taken it out too? <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's beautiful how close to the wire that it gets. And there you see one of the handful of zooms that happen in the climax that give it a an extra bit of uh, emphasis. But of course, we're not done. With a wonderful stingy music cue, we are reminded that Blofeld is still around, and he, of course, decides to blow the whole complex. Of course, his key turns easily because it's Blofeld's key. Of course, it was a shame that they built this whole set, and of course, uh, it was not designed to um, survive. So, of course, uh, they had to tear it down. And uh, eventually, when they did this out in The Spy Who Loved Me, of course, they built the 007 stage uh, to contain it so they could, you know, still have the sound stage once it was over. That was uh, the big important lesson they learned. <laughs> Again, the optical of the uh, explosion of the volcano, the, the, the matting of the actual lava, it's, it's very not, not the greatest. And um, the, you'll notice there the explosions of the interior. Uh, when the explosions go off, the actual stuff on the floor of the, st of the stage, you know, it's, it's obviously a model shot there, and they just they sort of fling up a little unconvincingly. Um, voice of the shot of all the ninjas coming out, and they're all paddling at the same time so it's it's just a wonderful image and now we have the life rafts which again is uh, very thunderball because again it's the same ending really <laughs> and once again a bond ending on water which is really the iconic uh ending that we all have in our minds most bond films do end on water or in water in some fashion and uh, was established by the ending of dr no but uh the John Barry's Q here is such a wonderful finality to it, and we're having a nice uh, reprise of the main beauty theme, if you want to call it that, as we get the final explosion shot. Again, the, the opticals here, not, not the greatest, and obviously, you know, that's uh, the actors on the stage, but we quickly fade into this beautiful uh, shot of the sunrise, and then Bond and Kissy left alone adrift, a nice knowing moment for the audience, and we know this is the final closeout. Kissy finally capitulates, and you know they think they have the whole ocean to themselves. And of course, the gag being that the submarine's about to rise. And of course, that's given away here by the little zoom ins, and John Barry underscores it with those little pings, obviously like the periscope of the submarine. And, of course, to get that shot, they literally just reversed it. So they had the, the boat tied on top, the, the raft, and then reversed it. Money Penny gets the last line of the film. And just a, a wonderful moment for Money Penny. And that closes out You Only Live Twice. 
the fifth film of the series, the last film that Sean would do, uh, or so everybody thought, which sets up the first time the series would have to change actors and really have to figure out what they were doing because, you know, Little Twice is perhaps the biggest spectacle the series ever became. And, of course, the final box office was, uh, you know, a smaller result than Thunderball had been. So already, I think, after the film and after its reception, I think everybody sort of recognized that they, they couldn't keep going in this vein. It would, it would start to really run dry. And I think the, the producers were wise to realize that uh, the spectacle was really taking over. And I think that combined with allowing Peter Hunt to direct the next film and Peter Hunt wanting to return to a uh, more of the Terrence Young style, return to the, the actual Fleming material to get the story rooted again in, in Fleming's works. Um, I think all of this went into the pot, the, the, the stew that led to Honor Manchester's Secret Service. Of course, ironically, we're finally going to get the film after they've done the books out of order because originally Honor Manchester's Secret Service was going to be done you know, after Goldfinger. So You Only Live Twice is... Again, a product of its era, it must be understood this was really post the peak of Spy Mania and coming after Thunderball. I, I do think it, it does suffer in some ways, but it is still a, a spectacle that is amazing to behold and uh, you know should be taken with both historical and series context in mind. Uh, so it's still an iconic experience. But uh, it, it, I think, is without question the weakest of the uh, Bond films of the 1960s. I don't think that's a, 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 a thing that uh, most people argue about. Uh, I think particularly in, in, in story, for sure. Um, and after many years of reflection, watching the film countless times, things, I think the thing you miss most um, is, is actually the, in the story. I think the biggest thing that causes You Only Live Twice to be so different is actually in the writing. And that's not to disparage uh, either Roald Dahl or Harold Jack Bloom, but it is the first film to not have any input from Richard Maybaum, who was the key series screenwriter. And while he did share credits on most of the films, it was his writing voice, his knowledge of Bond as a character, his, his, his narrative focus that was the backbone of, of the series plots. And I do think you really feel it, uh, it his, um, his absence in the films that he did not write or have any participation in. And I think those are, those are some of the films that uh, really kind of stand out because when somebody writes so many films of a series and becomes so entrenched in this character in this world and, and, the, and the Fleming novels and everything, um, I do think Richard Maybaum is so intrinsically key to the Bond formula, to the success of the films, to the film's identity, um, that uh, I, I think it's crucial. And I think this gets most underlined because on the very next film, Under Majesty's Secret Service, uh, he gets solo screenplay credit and does some of his absolute best uh, adaptation work of, uh, of a Fleming source novel. So I think that's another reason why you know, uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service feels so immediately different. It's not just Peter Hunt, but Richard Maybaum comes back, and there's nobody else sharing credit. It is purely Richard Maybaum doing the writing. So for me, I think that's really the key difference. It's not even the change in director. It's not just being the film that comes after Thunderball and the spy craze really starting to die off. Um, those are all important elements, and of course, Sean Connery getting dis really dissatisfied and then really getting the pressure put on in Japan, leading him to throw in the towel and the increasing fractures and the Broccoli Saltzman partnership are also really starting to show around this time period. But talking about the film itself, I do think what really sets it apart and and really makes it the weakest of the films of the, of the six films of the 60s. I do think it is because uh, it is the only film of the 60s that does not have any uh, contribution from Richard Maybaum, who is the key Bond writer. No one understood James Bond better 
for this film series than Richard Maybaum, who really was the person who firmly entrenched all this stuff in people's minds. And there are so many key players in the production team. I, I wish I had more time to talk about um, all, all this stuff. And again, I'm just, uh, I'm, it's, I have so many thoughts coming through my head when I do these commentaries, but there are certain key personnel that don't get mentioned as much as they should. And uh, after many, many years of reflection, I think for me personally, what I miss most, what makes You Only Live Twice not quite live up to the, um, the other five films of the 60s is the lack of Richard Maybaum's screenplays, uh, of his of his writing voice for Bond. I don't think anybody will ever do Bond better than Richard Maybaum did. Um, but that's not to say that that the film uh, it doesn't have a great legacy and is not a great film because it is a great film. It is a different kind of film. That's that's the key distinction there. It is a true spectacle and because it's a spectacle it doesn't have that same narrative focus that the other films do of the 1960s and that's what makes it feel so different and I also think it's key that it has some of that Peter Hunt sharpness return to the editing and he keeps the runtime down and I think that helps to make it play better because I think if it was over two hours it would become really much more unbearable I think a lot more people would complain about it in the way they do about Thunderball feeling slow and I think another key thing is the producers insisting that Roald Dahl really follow Thunderball as a template in the writing uh, so again I think you can make a lot of allusions to Thunderball and of course again Another key element is they, everybody was react, trying to react to the massive success the series had had. And eventually with everything, there is a sort of falling off point. There's, there's, a, there's a, a, a tip of the growth on the chart. There's a plateau. So You Only Live Twice maybe is, is that sort of plateau. You can see that, that plateau and that sort of falling off in the box office returns. Because again, You Only Live Twice was less successful than Thunderball. Under Majesty's Secret Service became less successful than You Only Live Twice. And a lot of people were starting to think that, especially with Sean Connery leaving, that uh, perhaps James Bond as a film franchise and phenomenon was really done. And, of course, this leads into the end of the 60s and the rise of the counterculture. And a lot of things in pop culture really, you know, were stood on its head or completely changed. So Bond was in danger of, of becoming, uh, you know, looking as if it was old hat, which a lot of people really started to feel that it was. So with that being said, I think it's very important to understand You Only Live Twice in the context of his, of history, of its place in the film series, and uh, you know, understanding the production and uh, the the key factors that make up uh, you know why the film turned out the way it did. And uh, but it doesn't discount the fact that it is a great cinematic spectacle. So that is my commentary on Eolith of Twice. Uh, as usual with all of these, I, I really go in and have way too many thoughts going through my head at once. So I hope this has been fun and informative. And, uh, you know, I, I hope, you know, if, if you stuck through the whole track, uh, thank you so much for listening to me babble on. Uh, it's a pleasure to do these. And uh, I will meet you next time in my commentary for Honor Majesty's Secret Service. So with that, as always, very humbly yours and the motion picture analyst.